Yes, sir. different styles so that we can minister to different ones. 
and and for the worship leaders and musicians and everything, people that are willing to share in different styles of worship. And and this is my heart. If if we if we were from a big metropolitan area, we may could say, well, you know what? This is the way we do it. If you don't like the way we do it, you can go to a church somewhere else in, in our community, in our neighborhood. There's probably one close by that has church just like you like it. But we don't have that luxury. We live in, we will hitch the floor because we want to, number one. Amen. Amen. And secondly, there's not just a church on every floor. Well, there are a lot of churches. But still. <laughs> <laughs> there's not enough where we can say, well, we're going to do it this way. They do it that way. And, and this is my heart that we that we do a balanced approach in worshiping God. You know what? I, I, I'm not sure that God is really concerned about whether we sing Southern Gospel or Contemporary, whether whether we sing the songs of, of another continent, but it, yes, it come, that it comes from the heart. Amen? Yes. I have always said, I can worship God with somebody beating on pots and pans just as easily as I can even in on that. Just let me worship the Lord, or I'm going to. And number four, that we are a caring church family, that we care for one another, that we care for others in our community. Every believer is a minister. It is your responsibility as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ to minister to the people that come in, you come in contact with that have need, whether it's in the church, out of the church, or whatever. All right, I'm going to move to one more thing because I've got a little bit of time this morning. <coughs> Missions. We we must get missions right. If we are self-centered, then we are not going to fulfill God's calling in our lives. If we are self-centered, we are never going to be a blessed people. And there's a verse in Proverbs. I want you guys to look it up and if you can find it real quick. Um, there's a verse in Proverbs that talks about there is one man who lives so generously. He gives away generously. And yet he always has plenty. And then there's another man who always holds on to everything that he has. And yet he never has enough. And actually I think it, it puts it in the reverse order. It talks about the man who, who he, he clinches, he holds on to everything that he has. And yet he never has enough. And I want to ask you something. Are you a giver or are you a clincher? Are you a giver or, or are you a grasper? Are you, do you have a generous spirit? Jesus said, if you will give, then I will give to you. He says, give and it will be given to you. Press down, shake it together, run it over. As you give liberally, it will be given back to you once again. And I don't quote that exactly right, but y'all know what it's in there. Y'all find the Proverbs verse yet? We will get it later. You know, you got all these people with iPods and iPads and iPhones and iTouches and eyeballs and all this. You think they can find it in just a few seconds. <laughs> what about Brother Savior? You got me? I'm getting there. He's looking. I see him turning pages. Don't you have anything electronic? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to preach the word. But um, we, we must be givers. Now, how many of y'all are like me? You don't like to go to a church where they're all the time trying to hard time you for money, huh? I went to a church one time when I was a college student, and and um, best I remember, I had a $20 bill in my pocket, and that was a lot of money back then, still is. And I had some smaller stuff in my pocket, and it was a, it was a special event, some kind of revival or something, and the evangelist got up there, and he was taking his own offering, and he was, man, I, was, I had a generous giving spirit that night. I was fixing to bless him with the best that I had. And he got up there and started twisting and yanking and pulling, and after a while, you know what I said? Forget it. I don't feel like I don't feel so generous anymore after he's done been hard time with me for the last 10 minutes. So I don't like to be done that way, and I don't like to do that. Is that okay with y'all? That's right. It's, it's, it, it doesn't matter if it's okay with you because I don't like doing that. But when I do, I want you to know that I don't intend to do it try, trying to chisel money out of you, but I want you to know that if you will give, God will bless you. You cannot outgive God. Amen. You cannot outgive God. And I pray that God will help us as individuals to have a generous spirit and as a church that we will have a generous spirit. Now, we've been made aware of recently the Assemblies of God has asked certain churches to get involved in this, in this project. There's a small country in Southeast Asia called Burma. For the last 40-something years, the gospel has been outlawed in their nation. 
Up until the mid-1970s, they had a, a democratic society. They were able to preach. The church was flourishing. And then a new power, a new government came into power. And immediately the gospel was outlawed. Christians began to be persecuted. And, and the, the, as far as we knew, the gospel message went silent in the nation of Burma. But after some 40-something years, believers had begun to go back in there. And they, and they have learned that the church has not only survived, but it has thrived. But in the process, they have also learned that believers' Bibles are very scarce in the nation of Burma. And training materials are, are virtually non-existent. They don't have anything. And there are doors open now for the gospel to get back into Burma. It's still not considered an open country as far as the gospel, but there are opportunities. And the Assemblies of God has, 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 has opportunities to go in and provide resource study materials for pastors and for church leaders. And Pam and I were invited to a conference back in April, and this is one of the things they talked about. And I told Pam, I said, I believe that we, uh, we should take this back to our church and, and ask our church, can we help? And so, so I'm asking you, I, I want us to give $15,000 towards this project before the end of the year. And uh, I'm going to ask my family, my household, to, to make some sacrifices to give towards this. And if you, if God lays it on your heart, then will you give also? Let me share this with you. Every year, our, our church gives a lot of money to missions. This, I'm asking for this to be above and beyond what we normally give. Um, some of you, I don't, I don't know who you are, but Miss Debbie, our secretary, tells me that every month there are people that give towards missions. But we have not stressed missions enough, and I believe there's probably a lot of you that, that haven't known, haven't thought about it, and you don't give towards missions. And I'm asking you above your regular tithe and offering that you give to this church. And I'm asking you don't take from glad tidings. That's not the way that's supposed to work. But will you ask God to help you to step out in faith? And give a little extra every week or every month so that we can increase our missions effort. Because, as it's been said many times over, if you get missions right, if you get missions right, God will help you to get everything else right. Where's that, Brother Perry? I think it's 1124. 1124? Thank God for iPhones. I see Sister Jeannie waving it up there. <laughs> Proverbs 1124. I'm going to find it in my Bible here. That's right. There it is. Proverbs 11, 24. There is one who scatters yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Verse 25. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Isn't that something? You cannot outgive God. Amen. You cannot outgive God. Isn't that one? Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Sister Jean. I, you know what? This 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 uh, electronic stuff is amazing. And now, y'all haven't heard anything I've said for the last ten minutes because y'all been looking for that. <laughs> and the women, the women can multitask. Isn't that right, Sister Jean? Yeah. Pam, Pam can she she can sit down and read a book, read the newspaper, watch TV, and and talk with me all at the same time. I, I, one thing at a time is all I can do. Thank you. And Clay also found me. Just got the text. <laughs> Taylor texted me that Clay found it. <laughs> I love it. Title of the message today is The Spirit in the Word. How many of you are ready to hear from God's Word today? Amen. Amen. How many of you know that God through His Holy Spirit is willing to minister to us and minister through us and move in our lives today? The Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is no respecter of persons. And so what I want to do today, today is Pentecost Sunday. It is recognized throughout the church world. Uh, following Easter, there is approximately, what is it, 50 days, I think, till Pentecost Sunday. And that's the day that we, that we celebrate the, the birth, the beginning of the church when God poured out His Holy Spirit on the early disciples, on those first believers. God poured out His Holy Spirit upon their lives, and the church was birthed on that day. And for the last 2,000 some odd years, the church has been alive and thriving. And so we want to look at today the Spirit in the world. 
And that's the title of the message today. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. And uh, I'm going to give you just a second to turn to it in your Bibles. Uh, we want to talk today. I'm going to take you through a little journey, particularly through the book of Acts. In just a few moments, the, most of the scriptures are going to be on the screen. But I want to take you through a journey of God working through His Holy Spirit in the New Testament and right up to our modern day times. God is still at work and willing to work in our lives if we will make room for Him and allow Him to do so. Matthew chapter 3, verse, beginning in verse 7. But when He, He's talking about John here, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to His baptism, He, that is John, said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water and repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He, he's talking about Jesus here, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once more, we ask for your blessings in this service. We ask for your holy anointing upon the preaching of your word. We can do nothing without you, God. Help us here, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as we read through the scripture, we find John the Baptist baptizing those who would come and had a heart for repentance. The Bible calls him the forerunner of the Son of God, the forerunner of the Messiah, the Savior, which is Jesus Christ. John told them, he said, I am baptizing you with a baptism of repentance. But he said, there's one coming after me. He is going to baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. He is going to baptize you with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and with fire. Now back in the Old Testament, back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, the Bible tells us, God says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Now, the people in the Old Testament could not fathom, they could not comprehend a, a, a trinity, a triune God. I'm not saying that we can comprehend that today, but we're a little better equipped to deal with it. They lived in a time where polytheism was, was so, so, uh, so pervasive. That means that polytheism, they, people recognized many gods. They didn't believe in just one God. They believed in a God of the sun, a God of the moon, a God of the planting, a God of the harvest, a God of the river, a God of the lake. Just about anything that you can imagine, they imagined that there was a God watching over this. And so God did not present himself as a triune God, as a, as a God of the Trinity. He presented himself as one God. Now in different times, we see the, the presence of God manifesting Himself in, in different ways. The Spirit of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, which is usually the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. But, but God, had because of their misunderstanding and their, their, their holding on to this polytheistic attitude of believing in many gods, God presented Himself as one God. By the time the New Testament comes along, I want y'all to stay with me for just a minute, but we're going to get to it here in a little bit. By the time the New Testament comes along, Israel had pretty much gotten that out of their system. They had gotten away from believing in many gods, and they believed in just one God. Now, they often their hearts were hardened and cold, and they were not serving God in, with a, in, in a fresh anointing. And, and that's the reason John called them a brood of vipers, because although they believed in one God, they were hard-hearted and very judgmental towards people. And so he's telling them now there's one coming after me. And he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And he is going to baptize you with fire. And God through the New Testament presents himself as a trinity, a triune God. Now we don't understand that. We cannot comprehend that. But I'm going to tell you the way that we present it is he is one God, one being, yet three persons. That's still just about as clear as muddy water, isn't it? 
He is one God, yet three persons. Now, we cannot say that he is sometimes God the Father, at other times he is God the Son, and then at other times he is God the Spirit. We cannot say that he is only, only one person manifesting himself in different ways at different times, and I'm going to tell you why we cannot say that. Because we find Jesus just after this being baptized. As he is baptized, as John baptizes Jesus, we find the Son of God being baptized. At that very moment, a voice from heaven, the Father spoke and said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And during that time, at that very moment, the Bible says that the Spirit of God descended upon him in the form of a dove. And so in this, at this very one time, you find God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit active in that moment. Other times you find Jesus going and praying. If Jesus being the Son of God, fully the Son of God, if there was no one to pray to in heaven, then why would he be praying? And so we can, we can trace this throughout. Now, for some of you, it might be splitting hairs, but I just want to show you that there is a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one being. It's not like myself and Taylor and Benjamin being three different people, although they're my two sons. It's not like I can say one of you is the Spirit and one of you is the Son, and, uh, and, and we're three different people. No. You hit Taylor on the, on the thumb with a hammer, he's the one that's going to cry. I don't feel a thing. I'll feel pain for him. I'll feel bad for him, but he's the one that's going to cry. You go and tickle Benjamin in the ribs, he's the one that's going to laugh. I don't feel anything. God is one being, yet three persons. That's a mystery. We don't have an understanding of that, but that's the way the Bible presents it, and so we take it. And so the Spirit is involved in our world today. The Spirit of God has always been involved in our world. But since the day of Pentecost, to a greater degree, the Spirit of God has been involved. God poured out His Spirit upon all flesh. The book of Joel tells us that there would come a day when God would pour out His Spirit on all flesh and that people would see visions and that people would have dreams according to the Holy Spirit. So first of all, I want to show you the Holy Spirit in the New Testament for just a few moments. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, we find the Holy Spirit being poured out upon all flesh. The Bible says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, there were approximately 120 people. They were in an upper room. They were praying. They had been praying for 10 days. God told them, Jesus told them, you wait here and you pray and seek after the promise of the Father. And after 10 days of praying, after 10 days of seeking God, God poured out His Holy Spirit and they began to experience something that no one else in the world had ever experienced. First of all, they began to hear a rushing, mighty wind. They were in a room, they were closed up, but the wind of God began to blow through that place and they began to hear it. They began to experience it. Secondly, they said that they saw on the tops of every person's head, they call it cloven tongues, as of fire. They began to see something a glow, look like flames above each person's head, like divided fire, cloven tongues of fire. And then the Bible says that every one of them began to speak in other languages, in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Church, what we have experiencing here is the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Well, I tell you what, they had been seeking God. They had been praying for 10 days, shut up in that room. I don't know whether they stayed in that room constantly or whether they were in and out. I do know that they were 10 days in fervent prayer. But when on the 10th day when that Holy Ghost fire fell, that room could not contain them anymore. They began to spill out of that room. They were speaking in tongues out in the streets. And the people were stopping and saying, what is this? Every one of us, and, and Jerusalem being a, 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 a crossroads, cultural crossroads, there were people from all over the then known world at that time there. And they said, every one of us are hearing them speaking in our own language. Some people began to say, well, these are a bunch of drunk folks. Peter got up and he began to preach right there. I want you to take note. Peter, who had just shortly before denied Jesus, denied that he knew him, even cursed and said, I don't know who this man is. 
Watch them get crucified. Watch them raised from the dead. Experience the time with him after he was resurrected. And now on the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire, Peter gets up and preaches, and 3,000 people get saved on one day. Amen. We find a little later in the book of Acts chapter 8, Samaritan believers received the Holy Spirit. Now Philip went down to Samaria. And he began to preach the gospel. We find Philip active throughout the early chapters of the book of Acts. We'll talk about him again in a minute. But he goes down to Samaria and he begins to preach Jesus. And people start getting saved. You remember Samaria, don't you? Samaria is that place where Jesus went and there was a woman at the well and Jesus spoke to her about the condition of her life. She wound up getting saved. A lot of people wound up believing on Jesus at that time. But Samaria... Samarians and Samaritans and Jewish people didn't get along very well. But Philip, a Jewish disciple, a Jewish believer, goes down and he begins to preach the gospel in Samaria and people start getting saved. Word, word gets back to Jerusalem. Peter and John hear that people are getting saved down in Samaria and they go down there. And they begin to realize, man, these people are getting saved left and right. There was even a sorcerer, one who was caught up in, 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 in magical things. And people had even ascribed to him a title of being from God. And he didn't, he didn't put that title down. But then he got saved. Now I don't understand all there is to know about Simon the sorcerer. But I do know that the Bible says that he became a believer. And Peter and John goes down there and they begin to see these people are getting saved in Samaria. And they go around and they start laying their hands on them and praying for them. And people start getting baptized in the Holy Spirit just like that. People are getting baptized in the Holy Spirit and Simon comes up to him and he says, man, whatever it is that y'all got, I want it and I'll, I'll pay money for it. And Peter says to him, your money's going to be cursed with you yes. because you cannot buy what God gives. Amen. And so you, you don't know, I don't know all that. Look, I've always been confused about Simon. I don't understand. He, he got saved, but then he's trying to pay for the gift of God. You know what? Sometimes we do get messed up. I pray, I hope too late to pray, but I hope that later on he got his theology straightened out. But we see people filled with the Holy Spirit right there in, in Samaria in the book of Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 10. Peter is on a rooftop praying. He's staying at a friend's house. God gives him a vision. I'm not going to go through the vision, but basically showing him it's time to take the gospel to the Gentiles. You've got the Jewish people and then you've got the rest of the world. There's Jews and everyone else is Gentiles. Peter winds up going to a man by the name of Cornelius. He winds up going to his house. There's a lot of people gathered there. And Peter begins to preach the gospel. As Peter begins to tell them everything that has happened, the Spirit of God falls on them and they believe. And they begin to speak in other tongues. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they go out and they get them baptized in what? The Holy Spirit moving in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 19. It happened while the apostles were at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper region, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, not on, not on the screen, you don't have to look it up, but he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? When you became a believer, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said to him, we've never heard that there is a Holy Spirit. We don't know whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, and what were you baptized? And they said into John's baptism, and he says, well, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, talking about Jesus, who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul laid his hands on him, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied, and there were about twelve of them all together. The Holy Spirit moving in the early stages in the book of Acts, we find that God was about the business of, of working through his disciples, working through his believers. People were saved and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a pattern that we see taking place throughout the, the, the book of Acts. People are saved, they believe on the gospel, and then at some later time, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Stephen, and I told you, uh, or let's go to Stephen for just a few moments. You can find his story in the book of Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7. But in the book of Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. 
And we find Stephen in the next chapter, he's preaching the gospel. And the people get mad at him because he's telling them that you are going to have to give an account for your sins. You are responsible. And he preached Jesus to them. He shared the Old Testament in a, in a nutshell. Then he shared how Jesus came and died on the cross and made them mad. They drug him out of the city. They dragged him out and they stoned him to death. As they were stoning him, he says that he looked up and he said, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. Stephen, full of faith and power. That's the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. I told you we'd talk again about Philip. Philip, it says, was caught away in the Spirit in Acts chapter 8. Now, when they came, Philip, Philip was uh, being led by the Spirit. He's the one that went down and preached to Samaria. A lot of people were getting saved. After Peter and John began, they came along. They took over the revival. Evidently, Philip moves on. Philip then is walking down the road one day, and he sees a chariot going along, and he sees this Ethiopian guy sitting in the back of the chariot reading an Old Testament co copy of the Scripture. Philip comes up to him, and he says, Hey, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, How can I understand this unless someone explains it to me? And so Philip crawls up in the chariot beside him. They're riding down the road. And he begins to explain it to him, talking about the Old Testament, talking about the prophets, talking about the things of the old, the way God had made the world and everything, all the way up to Jesus coming into the world and dying for people's sins. And the, 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 the Ethiopian guy says, I believe. I am now a believer. You've convinced me. He says, what do I need to do to get baptized? And Philip says, well, there's water right here. They got out of the chariot. They went down and they baptized him. Now, now listen to this. You don't have to have a complete understanding of everything to get baptized. Every time I see people getting baptized in the New Testament, they get saved, they get baptized. You don't need a class on getting baptized. You don't need some thorough understanding. Whenever you get saved, you need to get in the water, get dunked under, and get raised out. It represents being buried with Christ and being raised to new life. I tell you what, we will fill the tank for anyone believer that gets saved. Amen. And if you don't want to wait for the tank to get full, we got wake hours just up the road. Here we go. So the Ethiopian unit gets baptized, and as they're coming up out of the water, the Bible says that when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the unit saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. What am I getting at? Philip is called away in the Spirit. Philip's just moving in the Spirit. He's preaching to the Samaritans. He's preaching to the Ethiopian. And now he's going down and preaching to the Caesareans. Caught away by the Spirit of God. That's what we see the Spirit of God doing throughout the book of Acts. So I'm going to just stop there. We're going to move on. If the Spirit of God worked in the book of Acts, if God is the same today, yesterday, and forever, if God is no respecter of persons, then I believe that the Holy Spirit is in the world today, working just the same way. Through believers, people of God who are willing to let the Holy Spirit minister in and through their lives. Now in the book of Acts chapter 1, we find, I want to share with you three things that the Spirit of God will do for us. First of all, He will give us empowerment. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. And to the end of the earth. Who's he talking to? This is Jesus talking to his early disciples. They are already believers. And he's telling them, I want you to wait right here until you receive the gift of the Father. And he says, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you are going to receive power. You are going to receive power. And then what did he say? What you're going to get is an experience. What you're going to get is those Holy Ghost new dads running all up and down your back. What you're going to get is something that you can just box up and keep for yourself and you can enjoy it like a little toy you get on Christmas. No. What he says is you are going to receive power and you are going to be my witnesses. Now, do you know why the Pentecostal Church in the United States of America is not thriving like it did 30 and 40 years ago? Because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. The Spirit of God is supposed to give us power to witness. How many of you say, well, I can't talk about Jesus. What you need is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can talk about Jesus. Is that right, Sister McGill? <laughs> Amen. Is that 
Is that right, Brother Dean? Amen. You get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can talk about Jesus. Now look, you might not be a preacher. You might not ever be a Sunday school teacher. You might still stumble and fumble about it. But if you get baptized in the power of the Holy Ghost, it's going to be a fire shut up in your bones. The Bible says, Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. Now, John chapter 15, verse 26. I want to share this verse with you. Jesus had said this earlier. But when the helper, it's all about the Holy Spirit. When the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Can I tell you another reason that the Pentecostal church in the United States of America is not on fire and thriving like it once was? is because we made it about the Holy Spirit. I've heard Pentecostal churches, and look, this is me, if I'm wrong, but I'm not, I'm right in this. But I've been to Pentecostal churches, I grew up in this, and it was Sunday after Sunday preaching on the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't say he's going to preach about himself, he said he's going to testify about me. The experience is not what we're after, the experience of the Holy Spirit is to give us fire in our bones so that we will testify about Jesus. As I prepared this message today, I said, Lord, I'm going to preach on the Holy Spirit today, but I pray that we'll get this so that we can preach about Jesus. Yeah, thank God for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what it's all about. The Holy Spirit is the agent that God uses to fill us and give us power so that we can tell the world what God has done for us. Empower. Randy Hurst says, evangelism is not merely human persuasion intended to convince people to join our church. Evangelism is entering into the work of the Holy Spirit who convinces of sin, illumines minds to the truth preached, to the truth of the preached word, and opens hearts to believe on the Savior. Listen to what he's saying. Evangelism is not merely human persuasion intended to convince people to join our church. It's not us trying to convince people to join glad tidings, but it is entering into the work of the Holy Spirit for preaching the gospel. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what God has saved us for so that we can live with Him forever in heaven, but so that also we can help other people get saved. We need empowerment. Secondly, the Holy Spirit today helps us and gives us enlightenment. John chapter 16 and verse 13. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak of His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. We need enlightenment from the Holy Spirit. He's not going to speak of His own authority. What is He going to do? He's going to speak what the Father tells Him, what He hears the Father saying to Him. He is going to testify of those things. He enlightens us. He helps us to see the truth of the gospel. He helps us to see the truth of God's way. He helps us to see the perverseness of this generation that we're living in so that we can cut across cultural lines, so that we will have the power of God, so that we will have the enlightenment of God, so that we can preach the word. Y'all get this? It's good preaching. It's a good message. Enlightenment. And thirdly and finally, we need the Holy Spirit today to give us enablement. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 31. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke, spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say of his neither did anyone say of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Verse 33. And with great power the, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. He gives us in power, he gives us enlightenment, and now he gives us enablement. So that when we go out, you say, well, I can't speak, I can't preach, I can't talk. No, you can't, but God can and God will through you. Whenever you get saved, whenever you ask God, Lord, here I am. I'm saved, I'm a believer. Now, God, I am asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit because I need this empowerment. I need this enlightenment. I need this enablement. And God will give you enablement so that you will have boldness that you have never had before.
before that you have never had before. Let me tell you about Peter again. Peter was a big old burly fisherman. He was outspoken. He, he, was, he was kind of an act before you think, speak before you think kind of guy. But he was also had tendencies towards cowardice. But we find Peter, once he is filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, he is up preaching and teaching and talking about the gospel. The verb of the chapter is following. He gets arrested. And then the Bible says that Peter, full of the Holy Spirit and power, gets up and he testifies again. You know what the difference is? He was a believer, but he was not filled with the power of God. And you want to know one thing about this power of God. Once you get it, you don't always have it. You've got to stay plugged in to the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, I need this enabled. I don't know about you, church, but I want the enabled. I want the enabled. The empowerment. He said, John said, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He told those that he was talking to that day as I come to a conclusion this day. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Church, we need this enablement from God. Yes, we do. There's a lot about the theology of it. You might say, well, preacher, I don't understand. You might believe it a little differently than I do. I don't have to talk about that. But I don't think there can be any doubt amongst New Testament believers today. That we need God to do something in our lives Amen. so that we can have the power yes. that we're talking about today. Right. The spirit in the world today. God is willing and ready to move in our lives through His Spirit. But He needs willing and open vessels. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. And as you're standing today, I want to present two things to you. Number one, if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, will you become a believer? If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have not made a commitment to Him, will you make a commitment in your life to God today? It's a point where you come to where you realize, you know what? God, I, I can't do this on my own. I, I've tried. I've tried to figure this out. I've tried to get things right. I heard a preacher on TV saying today, if it is in your mind that you're going to get your life straightened out, you're going to get over your bad habits, and you're going to get things right in your life, and then get saved, he said that's equivalent to a sick man saying, when I get well, then I'll go to a doctor. And I thought, you know what, that makes a lot of sense right there. You don't wait till you get your life figured out and straightened out to come to Jesus. You come to him now. That's what he wants to do. He wants to help us. First, he wants to save us, and then he wants to help us. And if you're not saved, if you're not born again, will you come today and let Jesus save your soul? He'll do it for you. He wants to save you. Secondly, if you're a believer and you will say today, you know what? I need something more. There is an experience with God beyond salvation. It's not just a one-time experience. It can't be. We find New Testament believers going again and again getting refilled. It's because life tends to take it out of us. The pressures and the strains and the temptations of life drain the Spirit of God out of us. It's something we need on a daily basis. There's a first time experience with the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, you, get, you receive the Holy Spirit. But then you come to God and say, God, now I want an overflow. I want this power that John the Baptist talked about. I want this fire that Jesus Christ talked about. I want this stuff. I want this enablement that this preacher is talking about today. That I see the New Testament believers experiencing. God, I need this enablement. God will help you in living for Him more completely. And He will help you in witnessing for Him more completely. If you want to be a believer today, come. If you want to be a receiver of the Holy Spirit today, come. This time is for you. Hallelujah.